today, we're racking the Morak. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm Derica, and you're watching City Studying Brews. Today, we're racking the Morats. Which is also known as a Mulberry Mead, or a Mulberry Melomel, depending on how you want to say it. Tigger's very happy to be here, too. <laughs> She's been very needy today, don't know why. Anyway, so, as we said, this is going to be a racking video. We're also going to do a little bit of a taste, because, hey, you know, why not? What's the point in making brews if you can't taste it? So. Like always, what we're going to do is we're going to take our Morats, which, in case you're curious, or you missed the other video, which I'm going to put a link there, I think. Um, we started this on October 10th of 2019. Today is October 6th. Yeah, yesterday was the 5th. My watch says the 5th, because I have to change it. Anyway. It's not October, it's November. It's November 6th. So it's been eh, close to four weeks or so, which is pretty much my time zone. And if you look, it's starting to clear out. We got some solids at the top. We got some solids at the bottom. It's looking really good. It's time to get this off those solids into a secondary vessel and let it sit and age. One of the things we're really excited about at this process, at this stage of the process, is the color. Look at that color. It's it, so pretty. It wasn't that pretty when I first made it. I was a little concerned that it looked a little too weak. So I was worried that there might not be enough mulberry. But we're going to find out today. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take this airlock out and we're going to stick that in. The red book of sanitization! Everything else here has actually been sanitized in there. We do use star sand for sanitization. We have a video on that too. There's been a lot of questions lately about using chlorine and using bleach and using vinegar or just using hot water. Here's the truth, folks. You do not really have to become obsessed with sanitization, okay? Clean your stuff in the sink just like you would your dishes. Use soap and water. People have said don't use soap. Rinse them off real good, let them dry, then put them in sanitization liquid, and you should be fine. If you can't get sanitation liquid, there's alternatives out there. I'm not an expert on that. Maybe we'll do a video on alternatives to star sand at some point, but today I don't want to say something wrong. Okay, boiling them is always an option. You can boil stuff just like you would for canning. Always an option. Dangerous, takes a long time, and all those other things that go with it. But that is always an option and will always work as long as you do it right. Okay, so let's get back to this video. To do this, what we're going to do is grab our multi-part auto siphon here. This is actually a racking cane. This is the tubing. And this is the part that makes it a siphon. When you put that together, there. And then you have a cap on the end. See that? That's where all the stuff goes in. This little cap, the thing that we threw away for years because we didn't know any better. I thought it was just a protective cap. Nope. What it actually is, is it's a, a muck preventer. It lets you go all the way or really close to the bottom without all the sediment being sucked in. Hello? Wish I knew that like five years ago, but you know, whatever, it's all good. So Derica is going to do the job of the siphoning and get all the water out of there. Put this in here. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm only going about halfway down because this process can agitate stuff and the whole process, the whole reason happening. for this process is we're trying not to stir the bottom to get it sucked into Yeah, it. we want to leave the sediment and stuff behind. We're gonna get some, and you can see there's already some in there, and it's okay, it'll settle out. That's why we're not bottling this. This is racking. Now, why do you rack? Well, you rack to get it off that sediment and to put it into what we call secondary fermentation, which to me is really a misnomer. Fermentation's done. This is done. It should be finished. There should be no residual, well, there could be residual sugars, but nothing that's ready to ferment because it's probably hit the yeast's alcohol tolerance. Let me back up and say that again so it makes more sense. Basically, the yeast has a limit to how high of an alcohol percentage it can live in, okay? In other words, it doesn't like to swim in its own waste. So at a certain point, it hit, I just cannot swim in this anymore, and it stops. It doesn't necessarily die, but it stops, and it'll go dormant, okay? Sometimes they do die, but not always. What we're actually trying to do here is we've built 
enough sugars in so that it goes to a certain point either above or just below or right around that tolerance to give us a sweetness level that we want. Too much sweetness above the tolerance gives you sweeter. Not enough sweetness to hit the tolerance means dry. Make sense? We have a video on that and I know I've been saying that a lot but we have a lot of little breakout videos and we're starting to make more of them to help explain some of these small ideas so that people who watch our videos all the time don't have to hear me repeat myself 50,000 times. <sighs> So, racking is the first stage to get all the excess stuff that we don't want in our brew out. Let it go into secondary fermentation, which can last for weeks, months, years, if you really want to. And what that does is it lets everything settle out. It lets it completely clear. As you can see, this is really cloudy, okay? This is a little bit clearer, but over here it's cloudy because some of that sediment got stirred up. It's just a natural part of siphoning. You can't possibly pull, it all, pull out all the good liquid without getting some. Some other things, people have been asking lately a lot about, can't you just filter this instead of siphoning? There are filters out there. I don't use them. I've never used one. I've done a very small amount of research into them, and here's why I don't want to use them. The amount that I lose is maybe like half a cup of liquid when I make a gallon brew. If I do a five gallon brew, I might lose a couple of cups of liquid. Not a big deal. Those filters are one-time use in most cases. You're gonna spend $5, $10, $20, whatever it is for each filter pad, and it's one time use, it's gone. Sorry, no, I don't really see the point in that. That's just me. If you want to use them, go for it. It's all you, but people are asking me what my opinion is. That's my opinion. I don't really have one on these things. I don't know a good one from a bad one. I don't use them. The other thing is a lot of people are concerned about our brews are going to spoil because we don't use potassium sorbate and potassium sulfite or meta by sulfite. Yeah. Guess what? In all my time of brewing, I've had one brew go bad. And that was because I abused it. I left it for far too long, like three months, with whole fruit in it that was frozen but not pasteurized. We don't pasteurize our fruit before we put it in, in most cases. I don't see the need. We freeze it. That kills off a lot of the stuff that will make this go bad. But we only had one go bad. And I'm doing the air quotes because it didn't go bad. It went sour it turned into a sour. It actually got a Brettomyces infection and turned into a sour. Wasn't something I liked, wasn't something Derricka liked, but it didn't actually spoil. My point is, it's so hard to spoil these things. Getting an infection is really rare. People go nuts for sanitization and there's just no reason. How's it going? Getting a lot of Gunk. stuff. It's okay. Sometimes when you have a lot of pulp and whatnot, like these were from real mulberries, you're gonna get more of it when you siphon and it's okay. It will drop out of solution. We do have the two rack rule. We might have to do three or four racks on this one. Not a big deal, it's okay. Every time you get a little bit more out until eventually you get this squeaky clean, crystal clear brew. That's what we aim for. As you get close to the end, see how we lifted this up? It's starting to suck up a lot more solids, so that means there's less, for, less flow for liquid. We lift it up, giving it a little bit more pressure for the siphoning, because it is actually a gravity feed. So the more height difference there is, the more weight is pulling down, giving it a little bit better speed. And you can also get a really good look at all that muck inside there. That would be known as lease. And now we are done. Okay, something I'd like to point out. You noticed when it was in here, we had up to here, there was very little headroom, right? Well, put into here, Look at how little headroom that is. That's ideal. We like to see that. We want it, you know, right up in that neck where it starts to go a little concave and makes it a smaller area for air to be able to touch our brew. If I had put it back into a container like this, it might be down here. Not good. For some reason, these one gallon wide mouth fermenters are actually a little bit smaller. So now comes a little bit of the science technical part of the show where we take a reading. Now I'm gonna use a hydrometer, which is basically just, it tests for the density of the liquid. It tests the amount of sugars in the liquid. As alcohol replaces the sugar, the gravity will go down, thus giving us an idea of how much alcohol we have in the brew. To be purely accurate though, you need a lab. So all this is estimation. It's within a point, you know, it's all good though, it's fine. It gives us an idea if the brew is working, if it's finished, or if it's stuck, okay? That's the important thing, is it's really about, is it stuck? So, what I do? Baster, 
Turkey baster, standard variety, got it at Publix. A graduated cylinder, it doesn't even have to have the numbers on it. You just need something that your hydrometer can float in, okay? You wanna make sure that it'll float and not just bang the bottom. Because if I drop it in here, it's probably just gonna hit the bottom of the bottle. I can't actually do that. If this was taller, I could, and it'd be all good. By the way, what you're hearing now is Tigger, also known as the princess of the house or daddy's little girl. So she gets away with a lot more than some of the other cats, though right now she's starting to become a little bit annoying. She's purring. <laughs> she knows when daddy talks, it doesn't matter. Okay, that nice red color that we had, I'm seeing, I'm seeing what we had at first. It's, it's very pinkish, which I don't have a problem with that. I just assumed that, because mulberries stain basically everything they touch, that we would have a lot more color. Um, perhaps I needed more mulberries? Not really sure yet. I am trying really hard to not stir this up too much, even though I know it's, it's degassing. That's why we didn't degas at all. I'm going to let it naturally degas. That way I don't have to worry about oxidization don't, and don't. things like that. You're taking a reading. I'm taking a reading. Okay. That way we don't have to worry about oxidation and things. Okay, so I'm going to take my hydrometer. And I'm going to drop it in. And it went really close to the bottom. Okay, so... A little spin of this. And we ended up at... I'll get around to the right thing here. 1.010, which to me says this is done, okay? It's got a little bit of residual sweetness and that comes to 15.57% alcohol, which is significantly higher than D47 is supposed to go. <laughs> so I'm gonna say the D47 is done. It's swimming in too much of its own waste. <laughs> so it's finished. I'm also gonna say that it enjoyed its lovely mulberry treat yeah it seems to have liked it so we're gonna put that back in the sanitizer i'm gonna pour off a little bit of a sample for us to give a taste of this it's cloudy it's murky and it has stuff floating in it but it's okay i know i just made it sound so wonderful didn't i <laughs> ah whatever little pieces never hurt anybody they're mulberries we don't want to eat the whole thing i think that's enough for a sample the rest I'm going to pour in very carefully, and we are going to get a lid on this. I know it's been sitting for a few minutes without a lid on it, and some people are probably very bothered by that. It is all right. There's so much CO2 coming out of this right now that it doesn't even matter. But, with the lid on, got an airlock coming. None of that. Yep, I can already see. It's it's pushing this down, pushing that up. There's gases coming out of here. We're safe. No worries about oxidization in any way. So, for now, let's take a look at this. It kind of looks like grapefruit juice. Yeah, like a pink grapefruit juice or blood orange or something. Right off the bat, first thing I smell is alcohol. And almost a, a sharp footy note. This is very young. This really isn't a, oh, yeah. a good time for us to be tasting it. We we're going to do it anyway, just for you guys. We though. were just curious, so, you know. This might need a lot of time to age. From, yeah. From the seeming, seemingly so. And that's okay, too. If you watched Brian's little one-on-one -on -one talk about his pineapple meat experiment, the our initial smell of this reminds me of what that smelled like. This smells a lot better than the pineapple it, we did it the does. first time. It does. <laughs> it does. It does. Admittedly, it does. But it has that really potent raw fermentation smell. That's the best that I can describe it for those of you that are used to fermenting things. Okay. It tastes hot, but there's just enough sweetness there that it's actually not bad. I don't want to drink it yet, don't get me wrong. It's a lot better than you would think it was going to be. Based on the smell. The smell made me go, oh boy, this is going to be some interesting... It's actually a little better than that, though. Yeah. Um, it is... It's it got is some toes. Don't get me wrong. Obviously <laughs> young. 
so it has all that roughness, all that. But it's also close to sixteen you around percent with the alcohol. alcohol, and with that alcohol percentage, it's not a surprise. But beyond all that, you do taste the sweetness, and, and that, the mulberry flavor is there. And that makes me think that giving proper amount of time to let this continue and finish out, I think this is going to be it's lovely. Be really nice. I am resisting the urge to add more berries to this at this time. We do have more, and I might even do a split batch where we do some of it with more berries and some not. I also believe, I want to give this some time, six months probably. I also believe, though, that maybe oaking this could make a difference. It would sure. mellow some of that sharpness of the alcohol just a little bit and bring out even more of the, the fruity flavor with the, the woody, oaky thing, you know, all that. We get a lot of questions about making Mellow Mills in general on when to add the fruit. Should I put mm. the fruit in primary or should I put the fruit in secondary? Can I answer it? Can I answer it? Can I yes. answer it? That's the answer. Yes. What I believe is this. If you put fruit in primary, you get the essence of that fruit. 90% of it or more is going to be fermented, okay? But think brandy versus whiskey versus any other fermented spirit, vodka, they all taste different, even though they're all distilled from a product, right? But they taste different because of treatment and content. So if you take a brandy versus a whiskey, they're made in very similar ways. One is grape juice, well, wine, really. The other one is more like a beer, and they're both distilled, and they're both oaked. But why does brandy taste different than whiskey? It's because of what they're fermented from. So you get that essence of the mulberry and the honey coming through as a fermentation. And then when you put fruit in secondary, it's very different. That's more like um, adding fruit juice, like making sangria, adding fruit juice to wine. You're flavoring that wine with the juice rather than the wine being made from that juice, okay? Yeah. So by doing that, you're not actually fermenting that secondary fruit or juice or whatever you put in you're just using that to flavor what's already there so when you combine that with the essence of it you get that one two punch along with the alcohol along with everything it works really nicely together they complement each other because it's the same thing now when you use one in primary and a different kind completely in secondary now you're starting to play with flavors and you can get really cool stuff to happen i like to put fruit in primary Theoretically, you could just make mead, just a straight up mead, and then throw stuff in it in secondary. We actually did that with the hydromel. Mm -hmm. We made a basic hydromel and flavored it three different ways. Another video, show them up there. But to me, that's almost like not really the right way. Now, when would that be the right way? And here's an answer for you on that. Ooh, I know what she's going to say. There are some fruits mm. that. And spices have properties to them that make them inherently difficult to ferment. Mm -hmm. So if you want those flavors added to a fermentation, you're going to start with a different base, maybe something neutral, maybe something complementary, and then in secondary, add those spices or spices citrus are the big ones. in particular um, that are hard to ferment to, to add those flavors into your brew without instance, worrying about ruining your fermentation. Cinnamon. Somebody just asked, can you make a brew with cinnamon? You absolutely can. But here's the problem. If you put cinnamon in primary, too much cinnamon in primary, it'll kill your yeast because it's an antibiotic. It, it is literally a natural antibiotic. People take it when they have a cold, we do, with honey, and it actually will knock out a cold just as fast as anything you can get over the counter. Okay? By putting it in primary, you are getting all of those antibacterial properties on your yeast. Not good. That's why you do that in secondary because all you're really doing is imparting a flavor with cinnamon. Cinnamon doesn't ferment. It's just going to impart a flavor. There's no sugars there to ferment. So that's a beautiful time to just use it as a flavorant, especially since the yeast is already dead. Plus, it might give you a little bit of extra shelf preservation of your brew, which is probably why Methaglins had cinnamon in it in the first place. Clove is like that, too. Same idea. I think that's all I got. All right. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you've enjoyed this. We hope it was ed educational, or as we like to call it, Infotainment. Ed edutainment. Edutainment. <laughs> Science-ish. <laughs>
If you like this video, give us a like. If you like what we're doing, give us a subscribe. Hit the little bell icon, because some people have told me that that actually tells them when we're putting out a video. And if you want to be privy to all the super secret stuff that we do behind the scenes, join Patreon or subscribe to our links below, and you get access to our VIP club on Facebook, where we put up content almost daily. Much of it might be, you know, what we're making for dinner, or just random... I felt like saying something. Or what we're drinking after our We real also job. ask for <laughs> input from our VIPs as to what content might be shown to everyone else. Yes. But, as always, thank you for watching and have a great day. Bye-bye.